So what is the future of the European Union? That's what we'll be talking about today. What does it mean to say the European Union has a democracy deficit? Is supranational governance compatible with democratic self-government? Will the British leave the EU in June? If so, what does this mean for the European project? Will Germany, the indispensable motor of European integration, pull back from the dream of a European political union? Will the cultural, political, and security challenge of radical Islam, both within Europe and abroad, strengthen or weaken the EU? What effect does Vladimir Putin's Russia have on the politics of the EU? What does the refugee migrant crisis ultimately mean for European political integration and the concept of an ever closer union? What does the future of the EU mean for the United States uh, and the transatlantic alliance? We'll be trying to answer some of these questions this morning. We have an outstanding panel of experts with differing views uh, on these issues and with differing views on the European Union itself. Now, I'm, uh, I'm particularly interested in the democracy question. The European Union represents a new form of governance beyond the nation state in general and beyond the democratic nation state in particular. So before we get started, I'm going to quote three European leaders from the left, right, and center who in the very early days, right after World War II, uh, were concerned about, uh, this is the before, in other words, Charles de Gaulle and Margaret Thatcher voiced their reservations. Uh, these three were concerned about the future of democracy in integrated Europe. Uh, from the left, in opposition to the creation of the European coal and steel community in 1950. British Labor Prime Minister Clement Attlee declared that Britain, quote, would not accept that the most vital economic forces in our country should be handed over to an authority that is utterly undemocratic and responsible to nobody. Uh, from the right, and at the same time in France, uh, the Gaullist leader of the National Assembly, Jacques Soustelle, opposed, quote, delegating our powers to a stateless and uncontrolled autocracy of experts. Uh, several years later, in 1957, in opposition to the founding document uh, of the EEC, which is the forerunner of the European Union, the Treaty of Rome, the founding Treaty of Rome document, uh, former French uh, Premier Pierre Mondes France uh, stated, quote, a Democrat may abdicate by giving in to internal dictatorship, but also by delegating his powers to an external authority. That was Mondes France in opposition to the Treaty of Rome. Now, our first speaker today is Todd Huizinga. Mr. Huizinga is Director of International Outreach at the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He's the author of a brand new book. Uh, it's here and outside. It's, um, the book is entitled, we're going to be discussing it today, and it's entitled The New Totalitarian Temptation, Global Governance and the Crisis of Democracy in Europe. It's published by Encounter Books. I urge everyone to get a copy. Um, it's in my view, as I've written my review there, it's the best book written to date on the European Union. Mr. Heusinger was a, an American diplomat for 20 years. He served as the political counselor at the U.S. Mission in Brussels, the European Union, and as Deputy Chief of Mission in Luxembourg and in American embassies and consulates in Hamburg, in Munich, in Frankfurt, in Dublin, Costa Rica, and Mexico. He also served on the European Union desk of the State Department in Washington, D.C. He knows the European Union as few scholars and statesmen do. So I'll leave it to Mr. Koisinger next. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I appreciate uh, your interest. Things don't look too good right now in Europe. Before the summer is out, Britain might decide to leave the EU. Greece is de facto <clears throat> little more than a protectorate of the International Monetary Fund, the European Commission, and the European Central Bank. Schengen, the system of travel across borders within the EU, is in danger of being abolished. Devastating ter terrorist attacks have occurred regularly in Europe since the 2004 Madrid train bombings. And as Brussels and Paris recently show us, the threat of jihadist terrorism remains palpable throughout Europe. 
So how did this all come about? In my book, I contend that the European Union's commitment to supranational pan-European governance, overriding the sovereign powers of its member states, is eroding democracy in Europe, threatening human rights, and putting the EU, in principle, on a collision course with the United States. There are five major arguments in the book. First, the EU is transforming Europe from a continent of democratically accountable nation states into a post-democratic order in which voters have little say in how they are governed. Second, the Eurozone crisis, the migrant crisis, and the increased risk of terrorism in Europe are all intrinsically connected with the EU's pursuit of its globalist, supranational dream. Third, because of their different views on national sovereignty and democratic accountability, the United States and the European Union are in principle on a collision course. Fourth, the fact that Europe is largely post-Christian, while the US system of government is based on a Judeo-Christian worldview, accounts for a radical difference between American and European views on the role of government. And fifth, many of the new human rights promoted by the EU are actually harmful to human rights because they contradict tradition, human nature, and the fact that human beings are not just individuals, but are also embedded in family, religion, and community. I'd like to concentrate on two things as a basis for discussion. First, I'd like to give you a little overview of what I believe makes the EU tick and make some comments on how it ticks. And second, I'd like to examine the clash of visions between the United States and the European Union. First, an overview of the EU. What is the EU in its essence? That is the question. It is very hard to say what the EU is. Anyone who attempts it is taking a big risk. So I guess I'm taking a big risk. There are so many different values, interests, goals, languages, and peoples that coexist within the EU. Also, the EU is unprecedented. Nothing like it has ever existed. Certainly, the European Union is unlike any other international arrangement or organization that, that otherwise exists. For example, the, some people think of the EU as a free trade bloc or a customs union. But uh, the EU is much more than that. The EU is much more than, say, um, the US, Canada, and Mexico under NAFTA. Neither is the EU like any other international organization that at first glance might seem comparable. Take the Organization of American States, the OAS. Both the EU and the OAS are regional organizations. And just as the OAS is pan-American, including all of the states of the Western Hemisphere, so the EU is close to being pan-European. But there are the similarities between the OAS and the EU end. The 28 EU member states with their constant coordination on every possible policy issue and their powerful common institutions in Brussels and Luxembourg are much more closely integrated than the member states of the OAS or any other international organization. So the EU is much more than a garden variety international organization. But neither is the EU anything like a federal state. The EU is not a United States of Europe. The EU member states continue to exist as independent nations. So what is the EU? When all is said and done, my belief is that what it comes down to is that the EU is a supranationalist project. The EU member states, in the interest of realizing an unprecedented degree of peace, stability, and prosperity, are pooling and thus relinquishing significant elements of their national sovereignty. They are ceding large aspects of their governing and lawmaking powers to the, supra to the supranational institutions of the EU that are distinct from the EU member states and that function independently <laughs> above the national level. The essence of the European project, not just the nuts and bolts of how the EU works, but the hope behind the European dream the heart and soul and mind of the EU is precisely this supranationalism. The process of European integration arose out of the ashes of World War II and the determination of European leaders that war should never again arise from European soil. 
that violent conflicts among European nation states, especially between France and Germany, should never happen again. And this was a noble vision. Above all, this was an understandable vision, given the devastation wrought by World War II and shortly before that by World War I. And despite all the problems that it has caused, this remains a powerful vision today, the vision of a harmonious and peaceful Europe united in the European Union with Finns and Cypriots and Germans and French and Spaniards and everyone else all working together for a better Europe and a better world. But the European Union is not just about Europe. This vision of the EU, the supranationalist approach as a model for a new way to is a model for a new way to order the world. The EU's supranationalism is all about global governance, putting the EU's form of supranational governance into practice on a global scale in order to realize world peace by overcoming, overcoming the unlimited sovereignty of nations, which the EU believes is the root of war among nations. And here, as a model for, for global governance, the EU has real credibility. After all, the EU is the only functioning model of how such global governance might work. So what is global governance? Most definitions that you'll, find, that you'll easily find are very technocratic. They don't get to the heart of the matter. Here's how I would define global governance following John Fonte's seminal work on this topic. Global governance is the attempt to introduce a global rule of law in the interest of achieving an unprecedented degree of worldwide peace, stability, and prosperity, not via a one-world government, but rather by the development of an ever more comprehensive network of international institutions that, that administer an ever greater body of international law to which nation, nation states are subject, that binds nation states not only in their foreign policy, but also in substantial areas of their domestic policy. The key to global governance is the development of a global rule of law, whereby no one knows exactly what this global rule of law will look like in the end, if an end is even meant to be achieved. The key thing about the global governance ideology and also about the EU is process, constant process, constant becoming, never necessarily ending, reaching an end state. So back to the European level for a moment. How does the EU, this attempt to build a supranational democracy, this model for, for global governance, actually work? As you know, it works primarily via powerful centralizing institutions over and above the member state governments and distinct from the member state governments. I'd like to quickly summarize some of the characteristics of the most important EU institutions that are illustrative of the nature of the EU and thus important to keep in mind. First, the European Commission. This is the EU's executive arm. It implements and enforces EU regulation throughout the EU. But it also has an important legislative function. With rare exceptions, it is the only institution in the EU that has the power to propose EU legislation. This power is called the right of initiative in EU parlance. The right of initiative means that the EU, that means two things, that EU legislation starts with unelected technocrats who are working in the European Commission, and two, that the EU executive arm has perhaps the most important legislative power, thus violating the separation of powers in a way that damages democratic accountability. Second institution I'd like to talk about, the Council of Ministers. The Council of Ministers is the institution within which representatives of the member state governments work together to coordinate almost all policies in their domains, domestic and foreign, political and economic. The Council of Ministers, important thing to know, is a single entity, but it meets in 10 different formations depending on the policy area. There's the Foreign Affairs Council where the Foreign Affairs Ministers meet, the Environment Council, where the Environmental Affairs Ministers meet, the ECOFIN Council, where the Economic and Finance Ministers meet, etc. So, another typical thing about the EU that kind of muddies the waters. It's one institution, yet there are ten basically completely separate formations. 
Another important thing about the Council is that the Council of Ministers is a both-and institution. The members of, of, of the Council both represent their governments, but they also act as members of a supranational institution, a supranational EU institution that is distinct from their governments and to which they belong in a much closer way than they would belong to committees in any other international organization. So this brings a lot of lack of clarity to the Council of Ministers. This lack of clarity, again, is typical of the EU, and it further muddies the waters of democratic accountability. Then we have the European Parliament. It's not really a parliament. It doesn't do many things that most national parliaments do. It doesn't have the power to levy taxes, for example. Most importantly, the European Parliament does not draft legislation. The European Commission does that. Its approval is necessary for legislation, together with that of the Council of Ministers, but the legislation is drafted by the Commission. I note here that the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers can both amend legislation as drafted by the Commission. They can amend it. Here's another twist that many people forget, really, about the European Parliament that re renders it completely unpa unparliamentary in the traditional sense. There is no majority party or coalition in the, Euro in the European Parliament representing the government party, and there's no minority party or coalition representing the opposition, as in other parliaments, because there is no government in the EU and no opposition. Rather, everyone governs together in a hybrid system of supranational governance. A final example from my experience in the State Department. Although foreign policy is supposedly, according to the EU treaties, a domain of the EU member states and not of the EU, the EU itself has become a huge foreign policy player. First, the EU member state foreign ministers meet monthly to coordinate their foreign policies as closely as possible in the Foreign Affairs Council that I mentioned a minute ago. Second, the EU has created its own de facto foreign minister with the title of High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy. Federica Mogherini is her name. She chairs the monthly foreign affairs ministers' meetings and sets the agenda for those meetings. She also travels extensively as the foreign policy representative of the EU. She was John Kerry's principal European partner, for example, in the nuclear negotiation with Iran. Serving the high representative, the EU has also created its own de facto foreign ministry, the European External Action Service. Day to day, I would say from my personal experience, the EU is as important a foreign policy partner for the United States as Germany, France, or Great Britain. It is usually, certainly in terms of day-to-day -day interaction of high-level US diplomats, more important than the mid-sized or the smaller EU member states. And this is an amazing thing. One of the US's most important foreign policy partners is a something that's not a country, with a government that's not a government, a foreign minister who's not a foreign minister, a diplomatic corps that's not a diplomatic corps, with all of these elements making and implementing foreign policy on behalf of an organization that no one, including Europeans themselves, has ever been able to define in a way that everyone can agree on. So that was my overview of the EU. The EU is completely different from anything that has ever existed before in the world. What's at the root of all this? How did this strange new thing called the EU come about? That brings us to the second of the two topics I'd like to cover, the transatlantic clash of visions between the US and the EU. This is a complex topic, of course, but in principle, what Americans must understand is that the EU and the US have fundamentally different visions of the world. The US vision of the world and of international affairs is that of a world of sovereign nations. The US hopes to achieve a more peaceful and prosperous world by promoting democracy and the rule of law so that the world system is distinguished by democratically accountable governments of nation states accountable to their citizens that cooperate peacefully with each other. The EU's vision, on the other hand, 
is of a post-nation state world in which war and conflicts between nation states are overcome because the full sovereignty of nation states has been relinquished to a system of global governance based on a growing web of international organizations administering a growing body of international law. So even though the Western and Central European countries remain the United States' most important allies, and I want to emphasize that, Europe remains our most important allies, this difference, this clash of vision, puts the EU and the US on a collision course. In principle, if not, thank God, always in practice. For one thing, anti-Americanism is an inevitable outgrowth of the European idea, if one thinks logically. As the world's most powerful nation state and one that jealously guards its national sovereignty, the United States by its very existence is the big gorilla that stands in the way of the EU vision of a world that has evolved beyond the nation state. There are many factors that have led to this difference between the US and the EU, not just the European experience of World War II and the desire to do away with conflicts between European nations. I'd like to mention a central factor in this difference, one that I delve deeply into in my book. And this is the religious difference between the US and the EU. The US is the most Judeo-Christian of the modern developed societies of the world. The EU, by contrast, is largely secular. The US system of government is based on a very sober, very Judeo-Christian view of human nature, and thus of government. This is the whole reason for the separation of powers and the checks and balances foreseen in the US Constitution. It is striking to me how in deeply indebted to Christianity, for example, the anthropology that implicit in the Federalist Papers is, regardless of whether the authors were themselves believing Christians or not. Hamilton, Madison, and Jay accepted that human beings, while capable of great good, were also flawed and limited, sinful, as Christians would put it. Therefore, the power of human government had to be limited and separated into multiple centers so that the flawed human beings who hold governmental power could not impose a tyranny on everyone else. And I would argue that these views on human nature that inform the Federalist Papers and that inform the US Constitution are still the prevailing instinctive view of most Americans today, regardless of whether most Americans are believing Christians or not. Culturally, in this sense, America is still more Judeo-Christian than not. The EU's supranationalism, on the other hand, flows out of a basically secular, social democratic view of human nature, out of the idea that social justice can be achieved through government action and through government planning. And this is not just a can, can be achieved. This is a must, must be achieved. For most people in, Christ, in post-Christian Europe, and certainly for the governing elites, this world is all there is. Out of that flows the presuppositional conviction animating most European elites that the highest justice must be determined by human beings and pursued via politics and government. So this is a radical clash of visions between the US and the EU. The clash between democratic sovereignty based in the nation state and global governance rooted to a significant degree in the clash between a religiously informed worldview in the US and a non-religious worldview in the EU. Um, I would like to give just one example of how this difference plays out. I had three, but for the purpose of, purpose of time, I'll give one. How this clash of visions plays out, how the ideology of global governance, though unrealistic, has real, real world consequences. Um, my example for this, for these real world consequences, is the war on terror. Whatever you want to call it, I know that the phrase war on terror has been subject to much disagreement. This has been the number one foreign policy priority of the United States since September 11, 2001. And in many ways, the EU has been our most important ally in this struggle. But, it's, but at the same time, the EU has often and repeatedly been our worst antagonist. Why? Because the advocates of the global governance ideology want to subject the US struggle to the war on terrorism to a potentially crippling regime of international law. I will name just one of many examples of this, the war in Iraq. 
The popular mythology is that the controversy over the war centered on the question of whether there were actually weapons of mass destruction hidden in Iraq. But before the invasion, almost everyone, including the French, the Germans, and for good measure, the Russians, believed that Saddam Hussein did possess weapons of mass destruction. The real dispute was whether a preventive attack was justified under international law and whether war could be legitimate without the approval of the UN Security Council. In other words, whether, whether, the, whether the US could do what it rightly or wrongly thought necessary to protect the lives of its citizens without the explicit approval of the other four permanent members of the UN Security Council. This was truly a battle of worldviews centered on the question of the legitimacy and authority of supranational governance. And the advocates of global governance believed that the US did not have the right to protect its citizens without a permission slip from Russia and a permission slip from China, to put it bluntly, to say nothing of a permission slip from France. Honest people of goodwill disagree on Iraq and on much of what the United States has done to combat terrorism since 9 There's been little precedent to fall back on, and the information on which to base policy decisions is usually severely limited and often unverifiable. The issues are very complex. We are dealing with all shades of gray in the war on terror, and we may never know in many cases whether what we did was the right thing to do. But the global governances don't want to deal with the real world of uncertainty and complexity. Their ideological blinders are firmly set in place. They want to realize their globalist vision based on a caricature of reality, and that agenda has immeasurably hindered the prosecution of the war on terror. So, what is the EU? Most people don't know. I'm going to be, going to go out on a limb here and I'm gonna say, most Europeans don't know. Most Europeans that I've talked to don't know. I've lived in Europe for much of my life. Most educated, intelligent, politically astute Europeans who do not live in Brussels do not know what the European Union is. But its beating heart, what motivates its supporters, is the idea of achieving peace through supranational governance. And extended globally, the idea of achieving peace through global governance. And as John mentioned in his introduction, the question of democracy is at the core of all this. The EU has never squared the circle to fit supranational governance with democracy. It has never figured out how its supranational governance can be made democratically accountable to an adequate degree. The problem, I believe, is that the circle can't be squared. So where are we now and what is the future <coughs> excuse me, of the European Union? Let me finish with a few brief summary, summary remarks on Brexit, the destabilization of domestic politics in the EU member states, the phenomenon of cultural exhaustion in the EU, and the continuing power of the European dream. Brexit. The heart of the Brexit question is the British people's right to govern themselves. The issues one hears about, such as British concern about the cost of social benefits for non-British EU citizens living in the UK, or protection of the city of London from Eurozone overregulation, are important but they are not the main point. The main question is whether the British people have the right to govern themselves and whether self-government is more important to the British people than the perceived benefits of being in the EU. The destabilization of domestic politics in the EU. For a long time and accelerating since the May 20, 2014 European elections, pro-EU establishment parties throughout the EU have been hemorrhaging, hemorrhaging support, and anti-EU protest parties have been gaining ground virtually everywhere. Some, but not all, of these protest parties are on the far right and the far left fringes. I think that's important to note. Um, they are not all on the far right and far left fringes. Unfortunately, few among the established elite in the EU seem to have drawn the real conclusion from this state of affairs. After 65 years, the EU has conclusively shown itself to be inherently undemocratic, unaccountable, and unresponsive to voters, 
and the voters want political power transferred back to their national governments, the ones they vote in and vote out, and thus the ones that are, or at least should be, accountable to them, the people they claim to serve. The first final straw that fueled this ongoing political upheaval was the, Europe, was the Eurozone crisis and the severe economic hardship engendered by the politically motivated decision to establish a common currency for hugely differing economies. The second final straw was and is the ongoing immigration crisis and all of the disruption it is causing. The latest final straw is the terrifying vul vulnerability of a Europe of open borders to deadly terrorism, as we've seen in Brussels and Paris in the last few months. The question is how many f more final straws can the EU take? Cultural exhaustion. The migrant crisis throws into sharp relief the impression, impression of a self-hating, dying civilization that has jettisoned the beliefs that birthed it and is no longer having children, throwing open the gates to young, committed representatives of a worldview that might prove itself fully capable of shoving a politically correct Europe aside and establishing something completely different atop the ruins of the European dream. Finally, the European dream itself and the persistence of the European dream. The European dream is not dead. Lost in their focus on hard facts, in their focus on European versions of it's the economy, stupid, the pragmatists in the EU have always been too complacent. If the pragmatists in Europe, dismissing ever closer union and such things as unrealistic aspirations that will never come to pass and thus can safely be ignored, if they've proven anything over the past 60 years, they've proven that they seriously underestimate the power of ideas, dreams, and worldviews. There is no justification for the pragmatists to indulge as usual in underestimating the power of the European idea. However much the Eurozone fast fiasco and the migrant crisis have exposed its inherent folly. The economic arguments of the pro-EU side in Britain, for example, in the Brexit debate, evidence that many British elites still refuse to accept that the EU has never been about economics. And they reveal once again that many economic elites have bought into the idea that supranational integration should trump patriotism and democratic sovereignty because they believe integration brings markets and buyers closer to them. Also, a sizable majority of the European political class remains in favor of European integration. And the continued indifference and acquiescence of the majority of European voters may prove too strong a counterweight to the persistence and determination that will be necessary over the long haul in order to roll the EU back to a more modest respect for national sovereignty. And crises have often proven to be blessings to the cause of European integration. The jury is still out on whether that includes the most recent crises. So far, EU elites have taken advantage of the Eurozone crisis to transfer unprecedented powers to the EU level and they are trying to do the same with the migrant crisis, and it's certainly not certain that they, will, that they will fail in that. They may well succeed in that. So thank you very much for your interest, and I look forward to the, to the discussion. Turn this on, I guess. Are we on? Adam? Okay. Uh, next speaker will be... Dalibar Rohak, he's a research fellow at American Enterprise Institute, where he studies European political and economic trends. Specifically, he's working on Central Eastern Europe, the European Union, the Eurozone, um, U.S.-EU relations, and the post-communist uh, transitions from post-communism. You want me to talk? Well, either way, you can go up to the podium if you'd like. Thank you. Um, thank you. I, I should probably begin by stating that I have a conflict of interest of sorts at this event. Um, I have my own book uh, about the European <laughs> Union coming out <laughs> next month. Uh, and uh, insofar as most people probably are going to limit their purchases of EU-related books <laughs> just a few pieces a year, it is in my very direct material interest to dissuade you as strongly as possible from purchasing Todd's book 
uh, and encourage you to buy my own book, Towards an Imperfect Union, A Conservative Case for the EU. It's out on May 11th uh, with Roman and Littlefield, both in um, hardcover and, uh, and paperback, reasonably priced. And if you, if you are keen on doing your Christmas shopping early, I think this would make for a wonderful <laughs> gift. Uh, but on, on a more serious note, um, when John invited me here, he said that I would find a lot to disagree with in the book, and he was right. Indeed, there is a lot in the book that I do disagree with. Uh, but to be fair, I thought uh, at the same time that this was a very interesting, very thoughtful, readable book, uh, and it was very often correct in its diagnosis of what has gone wrong during the Eurozone crisis, uh, in Mrs. Merkel's handling of the refugee influx into Europe, uh, and quite, quite correct oftentimes in diagnosing various dysfunctions of, 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 of the EU, such as, as, such as its democratic deficit. But the one thing that struck me once I picked up the copy at, 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 at AEI when it arrived was, was the title, A okay, New Totalitarian Temptation. I, I suppose I'm the only one on the panel today who was actually born and brought up uh, in a totalitarian regime in what was then communist Czechoslovakia. Um, it was a country where uh, dissidents were jailed and where people who were trying to escape to the West were, were shot at the border without warning. And, and so I think there is some merit in reserving the term for really those forms of government uh, that do require complete and total subservience of its citizens and not just to use it loosely as a catch-all phrase for things we conservatives uh, don't like. But obviously the title isn't there just to provoke. I mean, the title. Uh, does relate to the main argument of the book, as, we, as we've just heard, which is that European integration is a deliberate attempt uh, driven uh, by ideological considerations, which aims to replace democratic decision-making in nation states by, uh, by a far less accountable form of governance at the supranational level. And I suppose, uh, I suppose such ideology exists, and I suppose there are people who adhere to such ideology, and maybe there would be a time and place to direct a reasoned argument at them, but I don't think that you are going to get a lot of mileage from this argument in trying to describe and understand what the EU is, how it has come about, what are its problems, and what are potential solutions to these problems. Just you know, very superficial observations that one gets uh, after skimming the few, few, few first, uh, the first, first couple of pages of the book is that and the slippery slope argument that there is some sort of antithetical relationship between European integration and democracy, uh, I think, runs in the face of the fact that the 70 years of European integration has also been 70 years that have, uh, by historical standards, coincided with a flourishing of democracy in Europe. I know that there are issues with the project, democratic deficit, uh, overreach, etc. but compared to what Europe had known before, uh, you know, we are living in, in, in the best of all possible times, I would, I would, I would say. And also, um, quite superficially, if you look at uh, the events of the past couple of years, the numerous crises that Europe has found itself in, uh, it's very difficult to argue that these were accompanied, as have been accompanied by some unprecedented transfers of power to Brussels. Uh, the Eurozone crisis has not led, and it's unlikely to lead, to the formation of a proper fiscal union. Europe European institutions have not acquired taxing powers. Uh, the refugee crisis is a reaffirmation of, of national level politics on a, on a grand scale. And even, even on matters of foreign policy, it wasn't Federica Mogherini who was negotiating uh, the Minsk agreements with Mr. Putin and Mr. Poroshenko. It was, it was European leaders. But I think, so, so these are just sort of you know, superficial uh, observations, but I think they are Deeper problems running through the argument, uh, which to me suggests that this might not be the best way to frame the discussion. Once you start equating sovereign nation states with democracy and, and, and global governance with erosion of, 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 of limited government, or if not despotism, I think you, le you, you run into all sorts of puzzles that the book leaves largely unexplained. So here's one. How is it possible that so many pro-limited government, pro-market voices uh, have been consistently in favor of restraining national sovereignty in one way or another. Here's, here's one example. In 1939, before the outbreak of the Second World War, uh, Friedrich von Hayek, the dean of the free market movement, founder of the Montpellerin Society, wrote a little essay called On Economic Conditions of Interstate Federation. And in that book, he argues that the main problem with 19th century classical liberalism 
was that it didn't take into account the problems that arise uh, with uh, the lack of a common interstate structure of international security. So, so, so you can't really realize harmony of interest between citizens of different states unless you have this common, common framework of international security, as he calls it. And he goes on to explain what he means by that. And by that, he means actually a common federal government in Europe. And, and he's very unambiguous about that. He says that uh, under that government, certain strictly defined powers are transferred to an international authority. Um, and in his view, there is no conflict between this idea and that of limited government and free enterprise. Indeed, he, can, he says that the two are mutually reinforcing that, in fact, open markets are a necessary prerequisite for successful federation, and vice versa, I quote, the abrogation of national sovereignties is the logical consummation of the liberal program. And by liberal, he means classical liberal. He doesn't mean in the sort of American lefty sense. And Hayek in this was not an extremist. He wasn't on the fringe. Uh, you find the same claims, the same sort of arguments in the works of Lionel Robbins of London School of Economics, Hayek's colleague, uh, Wilhelm Repke, who was a co-founder of the Mont Pelerin Society, who argued that Swiss-style federalism should be scaled up to the European level uh, to provide a common framework of governance. Even Ludwig von Mises, no less a limited government ideologue, if you will, actually consulted for Kudenhofer Kallergis uh, pan-European union and, 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 and argued that the alternative to a European federation was not unrestricted sovereignty, but, I quote, ultimate subjugation by totalitarian powers. So that's, that's von Mises in 1944. And I hate to, I hope Niall doesn't take it as a microaggression, uh, <laughs> but, but it should not be forgotten that when Lady Thatcher campaigned in favor of, uh, of UK's membership in the EEC in 1975, she did so with the very clear understanding that it meant placing limits on national sovereignty. She compares uh, uh, European communities to to NATO, and she says, look, we, our sovereignty, our ability to make discretionary decisions is restricted by, by our NATO membership. And, and here's a quote from, from a speech she gave in North London in 1975 before the referendum, and she says that Britain has for generations thought of herself as a power that was different in kind, and it is this sense of distinctiveness that the anti-Europe campaign play upon when they promise independence. And their prospectus ignores the fact that almost every major nation has been obliged to pool significant areas of sovereignty so as to create more effective political units. Okay, so that's Lady Thatcher. I'm not quoting her or Hayek to invoke their authority, but I think that as long as you are going to claim uh, that you're part of the same intellectual tradition, yet depart on them, from them, from, from these people on a point of substantive importance, I think you have to do some explaining that I, that I didn't really find in the book. There is a subsidiary argument to this, to this claim uh, about uh, essentially uh, European governance replacing national level democracy. And that claim has to do with, with religion. So, so Todd argues that because European idea represents a utopian commitment on the part of its proponents, it cannot be uh, reconciled with, with, with Christianity. Uh, there is no place for Christianity in the project. Europe is a post-Christian nation. And to substantiate that claim, um, the book walks us through EU's various legal documents, the Lisbon Treaty, uh, the 2004 Constitution for Europe, which are compared to the U.S. Constitution, to the Polish Constitution, to the Federalist Papers, which obviously all make some references to, to God and religion and, and, and Christianity. But, and my, my immediate reaction was that it really, that really didn't really pass the, 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 the smell test, because I mean, you know, we know for a fact that European society is far less religious than Poland, on average. European society is far less religious than the United States, and certainly much less religious than the United States were in the 18th century. So I mean, that's reflected in, in, in the documents driving European integration. Um, and, and, and to me, that's a sort of more compelling, far simpler explanation than, uh, than, than the one that, that, that invokes the European ideology. And if you are going to claim, if you're going to claim that European integration has been somehow instrumental in the erosion of Christian beliefs uh, in Europe, you then have to grapple with the fact that the founding fathers of this ideology, the founding fathers of, of, of integrated Europe, uh, Jean Monnet, de Gasperi, Robert Schumann, Konrad Adenauer, Joseph Beck of Luxembourg, were also the leading figures of European Christian right. Okay, these were all practicing Catholics who were very serious about their religion. In 1951, before the beginning of negotiations of the Treaty of Paris, 
uh, the Gasperi, Schumann, and Adenauer met at a Benedictine monastery on the Rhine for a day of meditation and prayer. Here's, by the way, what Adenauer had to say about Christianity. He says that only Christian precepts guarantee justice, or the moderation, dignity, and liberty of individual. That's true and genuine democracy. We regard the lofty view that Christianity takes of human dignity, etc., and use it as the directive of our work in the political, economic, and cultural life of our people. So that's Adenauer. 1954, Paul André Spack, Prime Minister of Belgium, uh, the founding father, you know, buildings named after him in Brussels, uh, asks the following question. Do you need me to remind you that if you sometimes think differently, you all pray in the same way? Is it the same gestures that welcome you to life, the same words which console you, calm you as you reach death? We are members of the same civilization known as Christian civilization. So, okay, so these are the founding fathers of, of post-Christian EU, if you will. Um, you know, Pope Pius XII came in support of the European project repeatedly in many speeches. Pope uh, John XXIII's encyclical Mater et Magistra, 1961, discusses subsidiarity uh, at some level of detail, and its content, albeit in a different context, is repeated almost verbatim in the Maastricht Treaty. Again, I'm not making an argument by authority, but if you are going to make the case for a post-Christian nature of the European project, you have, to, you have to explain what it is that you see about the project that these people didn't see. Um, by the way, I was quite surprised to see how much space the book dedicates to this issue, which is certainly interesting, but, but to me is not really at heart of, 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 of the political, economic, and social troubles uh, plaguing Europe today. So there are four or five chapters in the book, depending on how you count, dedicated to issues of religion, sexuality, abortions, LGBTI rights, anti-discrimination, compared to two chapters about the Eurozone crisis. Okay, the, the index I counted made, made 15 mentions of the Euro uh, and 19 mentions of LGBTI rights. And I don't share Todd's view on LGBTI rights, but I understand where he's coming from, and I respect it. But I don't understand why he's making this basically a centerpiece of a book that's, that's about the EU. And by any account, these issues are tangential. I mean, it's not the case that the EU is imposing same-sex marriage on hapless European populations. You know, Ireland held the referendum. Uh, you, know, you look at any, any opinion polls, there has been this massive shift in public opinion, sociological shift, cultural shift over the past 20 years, which is endemic to the Western world. Whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing, uh, you know, 61% of EU citizens are in favor of same-sex marriage compared to 60% of Americans, compared to 64% of Australians, uh, compared to 91% of the Dutch, 87% of the Danes. So it's not, if anything, EU institutions and ECJ jurisprudence, which I mean, is extremely limited in this area, are trailing far behind all this ferment and controversies in, in member states. I, I'm going to stop now, and I want to stress that there are merits to the book. I enjoyed reading it. I, I think I learned a lot just reflecting on it, but, but I'm afraid to say that I also think that it's a missed opportunity to ask some important questions about European integration. And by the way, I don't think that Todd was a fundamentalist in the exposure of his Euroscepticism. He doesn't want the EU to go away. He doesn't say that you know, it feels, fulfills no useful role whatsoever and it should just disappear. He, he, he says that he wants to transform it into a platform for sovereign uh, nation states. Uh, but the book did, that doesn't really tell us what, what's meant by that in practical terms. And the, the reason why it doesn't tell us is, is because I think that um, the intellectual framework, the sort of binary choice between sovereign nation state level democracy and global governance, doesn't give you much mileage in, in, in getting at the, at the answers. Um, yeah, there's, 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 there are like roughly two pages at the end dedicated to the question of European reform. And it's not a coincidence, um, because the question isn't binary. The question isn't whether we want sovereign nation states or whether we want global governance. The question is really what, what, what Danny Roderick, Harvard economist, calls um, globalization trilemma. Right? I mean, it's a sort of impossibility theorem of sorts that states that at some fundamental level, National sovereignty, democracy, and deep economic integration, deep economic integration are mutually incompatible. That you can have at any point, you can have two out of the three, but you can never have all three uh, simultaneously and in full. And once you adopt that alternative mindset, which by the way is how most economists, I would argue, think about European issues, you don't see you know, a grand battle of good and evil, you'll see trade-offs. And you see, you know, do we want more sovereignty? Do we want uh, deeper economic ties? Do we want more democracy? And, and maybe that's not the right framework. I'm not making the case for it. But if you are going to 
present an alternative. I think you have to engage in some way with the literature on the subject. You have to explain why, why your alternative uh, discussion leads to a richer, uh, richer uh, presentation of, of what, what the use problems and solutions are. And I don't quite see that uh, done in this book, unfortunately, but maybe I'm just sort of embittered and I'm saying that out of my own immediate material interest. Remember, it's out on May 11. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'll have Niall Gardner. He's director of the Margaret Thatcher Center for Freedom at the Heritage Foundation in Washington, D.C. Um, he's worked at the heart of Washington policy for over a decade. And before joining Heritage, um, Dr. Gardner served as an aide to former Bri British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher, advised her on her, uh, on her, uh, first, her final book, Statecraft Strategies for a Changing World. Thanks very much, uh, John. It's great, great to be here at the Hudson Institute in the uh, fantastic new, uh, new building here. Uh, and um, I'd like to start by saying that uh, you know, Todd's book is really terrific. It's, uh, I think, one of the finest books written so far on the, um, dare I say, the evils of the European project. Uh, and it's a book that uh, my former boss, Margaret Thatcher, would have loved reading. She would have devoured it, I think. I, I think she would have... Um, uh, enjoyed it uh, thoroughly, and it, it's a very, very uh, insightful look into the current state of affairs with regard to uh, to the European Union, and it's certainly not a pretty state of affairs by any stretch of the imagination. In fact, uh, the word disaster, I think, could be easily be applied to the current state of affairs uh, with regard to the EU. Uh, and I'd like to uh, talk this morning about um, the Brexit debate in Britain, how that is moving forward, uh, what the issues are, and uh, where, that's, uh, where that's going to end up. Uh, also, I'd like to address the, uh, the, the refugee crisis, the national security threat in Europe. Um, and also, I'd like to talk about um, you know, what the next US uh, president, the next US administration should be doing with regard to, uh, to Europe. And I'd uh, like to advocate a, a complete reversal of traditional U.S. support for the, uh, for the European project. I'd like to begin, though, um, by placing you uh, in, into the heart of what is really at stake in, in Europe with regard to national sovereignty. And I'd like you all to imagine now if the United States was part of a, a pan-American project, the equivalent of the, of the European project, but one stretching from Argentina up to Canada. Imagine if there was a, a Schengen-style agreement eliminating border controls between almost every country in South America and, and North America with complete freedom of movement uh, between uh, these countries uh, across a pan-American pan uh, uh, European project-style institution. Imagine if there was a pan-American uh, commission in Mexico City shaping potentially two-thirds of U.S. laws. Imagine a Pan-American court in Buenos Aires ruling over the U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, imagine if there was a drive to create a Pan-American army as a competitor to the NATO alliance, drawing in crucial U.S. military resources under the command perhaps of Venezuelan or Brazilian generals. Imagine if the United States sent members of parliament to a pan-American uh, parliament uh, in a South American city with those members of parliament lecturing the American people on how they should be living their own lives. This is really the, the reality on the ground in Europe today with regard to, uh, to the European uh, project. And the European Union is nothing less than a, a huge surrender of national sovereignty uh, within Europe. And of course, Britain is not part of the Schengen uh, Agreement, which covers 22 uh, members of the European Union and 26 European countries in, in total. But Britain, like every other member of the European Union, is part and parcel of the European project. Uh, and the Brexit referendum in Britain, which will be held on June 23rd, which will decide Britain's future uh, in, in Europe, is all about 
whether or not the British people are going to reject the European project, whether or not the British people will reassert self-determination and national sovereignty. And this is about Britain really being, once again, a truly sovereign and independent nation. If two-thirds of, of your laws originate in Brussels, you're not a free country. If your courts are subject to the rulings of a court in Luxembourg, you're not a free country. I don't think the American people would ever subject themselves to the supranationalism of something like the European Union. Uh, and I don't think that uh, you know, the American people should, uh, uh, should accept the idea that the British people should have their sovereignty submerged within a European project that exemplifies a sort of big government uh, mindset at the heart of, of Europe. And when you ask uh, a lot of British people what they, what they think of the European Union, what, what does the European Union actually mean uh, to them, many Brits will, will tell you that the European Union means foreign bureaucrats, European courts telling the British people what to do. The European Union also is, has become a symbol of big government, corruption, inefficiency, a lack of democratic accountability. The European Union is also about the absence of border controls and the ability to be able to control who comes into your own country. These are all huge issues for the, for the British people. The latest opinion polls show that uh, the Brexit campaign and the, uh, the Remain campaign are basically uh, almost neck and neck. But if you look at polls which focus upon uh, voter turnout uh, and voter enthusiasm, uh, some of those polls show a significant lead for the, for the Brexit side. Uh, in fact, one recent poll showed an 8% lead, actually, for, for the Brexit campaign over the Remain side. And I think the Brexit debate is shaping up as a, as a battle between, uh, in large part, the, the grassroots, uh, particularly the grassroots of the, of the Conservative Party, uh, and the, the political elites and the political establishment. After all, David Cameron, the British government, is officially supporting Britain staying inside the European Union. There are five cabinet rebels uh, who are campaigning for Brexit. There used to be six. Ian Duncan Smith uh, recently resigned. Uh, from, the, from the cabinet. Also, the mayor of London, Boris Johnson, has joined the Brexit uh, campaign. And about half of uh, conservative MPs are, uh, are backing uh, Brexit and about 70% of conservative party uh, members. Um, but this has become, I, I think, a tremendous battle between uh, you know, largely grassroots conservatives combined with uh, you know, a sizable chunk as well of the Labour Party as well who are in support of Britain leaving the European Union, battle between the grassroots and also uh, the, the, the political elites uh, in, in Britain and the business elites uh, as well. Uh, and there's been a great deal of controversy this week with regard to um, uh, David Cameron's government spending £9 million on a leaflet campaign aimed at every one of the 27 million households across, the, across Britain using government uh, money and a printing company that's actually owned by a German firm that uh, receives a large number of uh, EU subsidies and handouts. Uh, so the irony there is not lost on, on the British, uh, British people. But, but I do think that um, the British people are being offered an opportunity to uh, jump on a lifeboat that's being thrown off the side of the, of the Titanic, because that's what the European Union really is uh, today. And I think the EU in its current form won't last and it won't, uh, it won't survive. Uh, and, and nor should it in its current form, actually. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, for, for millions of British people, uh, this is an issue, a fundamental issue of self-determination and sovereignty and the ability to control their own, uh, their own borders. Uh, President Obama will be traveling over to, uh, to London in a couple of weeks' time, reportedly to tell the British people how to vote in their own referendum. Uh, and needless to say, there's been a furious backlash uh, already uh, in the British press uh, over this. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it's the, the role of the US uh, president to be telling the British people how to vote in their, own, in their own referendum. And needless to say as well, I think that President Obama is, uh, is completely wrong uh, with regard to, uh, to the European Union uh, as a whole. And this administration, the Obama administration, has been a steadfast supporter of Euro-federalism. 
It has to be said that many previous U.S. administrations have also uh, backed the idea of a, uh, of, of a federal uh, Europe. But uh, perhaps this might be the last U.S. administration to, to do so, and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, uh, a, a bit later. But um, the emphatic message, I think, from the British people should be to the President Obama that he needs to mind his own business with regard to uh, the issue of the British referendum. Um, and it's not his, his role to be telling the British people what they should be thinking on a fundamental matter of, of British national interest. Um, it's also been suggested by uh, President Obama, a number of leaders in Europe, uh, many across the world, that Britain would actually struggle to, uh, to survive outside of the, uh, outside of the European Union, uh, and that uh, Britain would be a weaker partner on the international uh, stage. I have to say that uh, that's really um, uh, nonsense, frankly. And uh, you know, Great Britain today is the world's fifth largest economy. It will overtake Germany probably by 2030 uh, as the, uh, the largest economy uh, in Europe. Uh, it is a nuclear power, a permanent member of the UN Security Council, a great trading nation, uh, a country with one of the most powerful militaries uh, on the face of the earth. And the idea that Britain couldn't survive outside of the European Union uh, I think just uh, just beggars uh, beggars belief, and as part of what has been dubbed in Britain uh, Project Fear, uh, the idea that that a nation that once held sway over a third of the world's surface cannot survive outside of this European uh, club, uh, and I think the you know the whole argument of the uh, the Remain side, based upon real fear mongering and scare mongering isn't being bought by a majority of the, of the British uh, uh, public. And if indeed uh, the, the British people decide to leave the European Union, I would hope that the United States will do all it can to ensure that the Anglo-American special relationship remains strong, is greatly strengthened further, that the United States signs a, a free trade agreement with the United Kingdom. Uh, and, and I think that Brexit will offer tremendous opportunities, actually, for US-UK cooperation. A Britain freed from the shackles of the European Union will be a far stronger ally for the United States uh, on the international uh, stage. There's also been a suggestion that a British exit from the European Union would weaken the, the NATO alliance or weaken uh, national security for, for Great Britain, weaken national security in Europe. Uh, again, I, I fundamentally disagree uh, with that. I hardly think that uh, you know, Vladimir Putin loses sleep at night over the, the European Union standing up to his aggression in, in Ukraine, for example. The EU really is a, is a paper tiger. Uh, Putin understands the strength of the NATO alliance. He understands the strength of the Anglo-American special relationship. But the European Union, as far as the Russians are concerned, has become a you know, feckless, weak-kneed force on the international uh, stage. Uh, and uh, I, I'm in no doubt that a British exit from the European Union would actually only uh, strengthen the NATO alliance rather than uh, weaken it. It would give Britain actually far more leeway as well to be able to stand up to the Russian bear uh, in Europe in terms of sanctions that could be imposed against, uh, against the Russians. And I think there are significant uh, national security uh, advantages for, for Great, Britain, Great Britain, not least the ability to be able to decide who comes into the country. Uh, and the EU border agency Frontex admitted actually earlier this week that Europe's borders are now so porous that 1.8 million illegal border crossings were made last year, six times the previous record set in 2014. Uh, Frontex also uh, declared that a staggering number of EU citizens have traveled to Syria to fight with ISIS. Many of those have returned. Uh, and under the Schengen Agreement, they're given the, uh, the freedom to move within uh, much of the European Union. And uh, I think that the, you know, the Schengen Agreement has become one of the biggest facilitators in the world of Islamist terrorism, allowing Islamist terrorists to be able to slip through the net very easily to travel from one European country uh, to the next. And the Paris attacks and the, uh, the Brussels attacks would not have been possible um, if, uh, if we did not have a, um, a Schengen-style agreement. Uh, and the, the scale of the refugee uh, crisis uh, in Europe is uh, it's vast, it's, it's immense. Um, it 
really does threaten the fabric, I think, of, of European, uh, some European societies in the future. Germany alone has taken in over a million refugees or economic migrants in the past year. 200,000 uh, migrants entered Germany in February and March uh, this year. Uh, this is costing uh, Germany 20 to 30 billion euros a year, according to uh, German uh, MPs. There are over 200,000 uh, refugees in Bavaria uh, alone. And Angela Merkel did all this, actually, without the consultation, without any cons consultation with the, uh, uh, with the German people. Uh, and then she then uh, went on the European stage, urging other European countries to take on uh, large numbers of, uh, of refugees and migrants. And the vast majority of those countries refused to, to do so. And we've seen the limits of German power uh, in Europe. And Germany is at really uh, the very heart of the, of the European uh, project. But I think we will witness in the next two decades a period of significant German uh, decline. Um, and, uh, and I believe that uh, if Britain leaves the European Union, you will see uh, Britain significantly overtaking uh, Germany as, as an economic uh, force uh, in, uh, in Europe. Uh, and... Uh, and let's, let's remember that the, the refugees coming into, uh, into countries like Germany today, once they become German citizens after a period of perhaps five years, they will then have the right to move over to, uh, to the United Kingdom and other European uh, countries. So the refugee issue in Germany, which is largely a self-made uh, crisis, uh, I think, on the part of Angela Merkel here, um, those refugees will have the right then to move to, to the United Kingdom. That's going to be a big factor as well in this Brexit uh, referendum. Just to conclude, I'm out of time here, but um, with regard to the future of U.S. policy towards Europe, I would hope that the next U.S. president will uh, embark upon a fundamental review of uh, America's traditional backing for the European uh, project. We need a new U.S. approach to Europe based upon support for national sovereignty and nation states. And America has no interest... Uh, in backing the creation of a European uh, superstate. And I don't believe such a superstate is in the interest of uh, European countries themselves. Uh, and the next US president, I think, has to reinforce the importance of the transatlantic uh, alliance, which president, president Obama has not done, rebuild US military power in Europe, sending a clear message to, uh, to the Russians that their aggression uh, will be halted. Uh, and the United States needs to stand up for the principles of self-determination, economic freedom, national sovereignty uh, in Europe, the same principles that the American people themselves believe in. So what is good for America as a sovereign nation is good for Europe as well. Uh, and I would hope the, the next U.S. president uh, embarks upon a policy that is fit for the 21st century and not one that is tied to uh, to the 1950s and the 1960s and the origins of the European project. Thank you. Jeremy Radkin is a professor of law at the Anton Scalia School of Law at George Mason University. Uh, love to say that. Uh, <laughs> uh, he's, he's been, he, but for two decades, he was a professor of government at Cornell University. He serves as a, on the board of directors of the U.S. Institute of Peace, appointed by President Bush, but uh, reappointed, I guess, by President Obama, reconfirmed by the Senate in 2011. The author of a great book, another great book on sovereignty, uh, Law Without Nations. Thank you. I, I particularly want to thank John for um, establishing my credential as somebody who has written a book about sovereignty. Uh, I'm for it. <laughs> but uh, I was a little stunned by Mal Gardner saying that Mrs. Thatcher would have loved Todd's book on the EU because, I mean, I like it, but I think my remarks are the kind of thing that uh, Mrs. Thatcher would have called wet. <laughs> Sorry. Being the uh, Antonin Scalia School of Law does not impose a doctrinal outlook on any of the professors. <laughs> you can just say anything. Um, 
So I, I just want to uh, briefly discuss three things that make me a little bit uneasy about the way Todd presents this um, challenge from the EU. And the first is, um, I think he's putting a lot of weight on the form of government. I mean, I know this is an old argument going back to Aristotle, how important the regime is, but really I think the EU is not able to be the decisive force in modern life that it sometimes appears to be in this book. Uh, just obvious example worth thinking about, Norway. It's not in the EU. But uh, if you ask, how does Norway compare to Denmark or Sweden or Finland on the things which um, this book talks about? Uh, declining religion, declining family life, declining fertility rate, growth of utopian fantasies, uh, growth of, you know, social spending. I think Norway is not at all different from the countries that are in the EU. And if you just step back and take in a larger view and ask, uh, what about Canada? It looks like EU countries. And the truth is, if you look at the United States, it looks like EU countries just a few decades further back, but you can see that we are on the same trajectory. Um, we, of course, have a declining birth rate, and to, to insist that America is in a totally different place from where Europe is, it's not a totally different place. It's just a little bit healthier, a little bit better off, but there are many trends which just seem to be trends of the modern world, for better or worse, and I share the sense that most of them are for worse, but there's a lot going on in the modern world, which is not the fault of the EU or particularly caused by the EU. Um, it was um, mentioned previously by Mr. Rohatch, do you say? Yeah. So um, it was the U.S. Supreme Court that imposed same-sex marriage. It wasn't the European Court of Justice. Uh, there are trends across the modern world that I don't think really map onto the EU way of looking at the world and the US way of looking at the world. So that, that's the first thing I want to say. The second thing is um, the subtitle of this book is The New Totalitarian Temptation. And uh, again, I have to say I, I agree with Mr. Rohatch. I, I don't like the EU. I think it's creepy. I think, <laughs> I think the net effect on Europe is probably if you net it all out, if you could net it all out, they're probably a little worse off. Um, they're sure not a whole lot better off. Um, but totalitarian, I think, is not a word that fits the people in Brussels who are spinning out all these regulations. Uh, it seems to me the central problem of the EU is not that it's sinister, but that it's silly. They have this fantasy that all these countries can be yoked together and they can have a common policy, and of course they can't be yoked together and they don't have a common policy. And so the characteristic problem is not that it's overbearing, but that it's weak. And you see this in the way the EU is dealt with challenges, it's supposed to deal with crisis on the border in Ukraine, and it doesn't know what to do, and so effectively it didn't do anything. Uh, Suddenly, this flow of refugees or migrants, this is a big challenge. Uh, uh, uh. Well, they, they don't know what to do, and they're not really doing anything effective. Terrorism, they don't know what to do, they're not doing anything effective. It's really telling, if you want to talk about totalitarianism, to say, at least in the capital of the EU, in Brussels, what are they doing to protect at least the EU ministries from terror attacks? And the answer is, um, I don't know, they're issuing documents and communiques and they're talking. I mean, they, they're not in a position to be totalitarian. I think that, that doesn't quite fit. And, and even I think it's an opportunity lost because what makes the EU um, utopian is, is, is not that it imagines that it can control everything. It's that it imagines that it can control everything without a very much force. Um, a lot of, a number of people have said this, and I think rightly, uh, there's a way in which it's postmodern, but postmodern means that it's somehow forgotten the lessons of the modern world. So it's in a certain way, as some people have said, neo-medieval. 
Um, it wants to have authorities that don't have troops. It wants to have authorities that don't have police. It wants to have authorities that don't have to actually win secure popular support. There's something about it that's just fantastical, and I think in the end, it, you know, this is not a successful experiment, but I don't think the way to characterize this as, ooh, it's totalitarian. Um, and so just the last thing I wanted to talk about is um, if you set this up as clash of visions, America sees the world this way, the EU sees the world that way, the, the suggestion is um, we'd have better partners if the EU basically disappeared or was reduced to an extent that it didn't have much influence and so we could partner with individual uh, European countries. I'm kind of skeptical of that. So I, I want to just briefly um, articulate the, the other way of looking at this. Um, most of those countries are small. If they are not part of some larger project, I think their tendency may be to say, our grand strategy is to duck. Uh, let me give you the example of the Netherlands. It's today's papers uh, have stories about the referendum they had yesterday. Should the Netherlands go along with this treaty with Ukraine? Now, this was not a treaty promising to send troops. It was not a, a military alliance. It was just Ukraine, let's have trade and let's have a partnership and we like you and we want to encourage you. It, it was not something that should have been very controversial. Why was it so controversial that people insisted on a referendum? Very unusual to have a referendum about a treaty like that. And then in the referendum to have it voted down. And just from reading about it and corresponding with uh, somebody who was involved in this, uh, there's a lot of people in the Netherlands who think this EU-sponsored understanding with Ukraine is a provocation to Putin. Why would we want to provoke Putin? We should try to get along with Putin. We should try to lay low and not have problems. And if you think, well, gee, that doesn't really make sense. Why should I? This is where the Netherlands was in 1939. It's where they were in 1940 until they were invaded um, in the first three months. Um, this is where they were, you know, through the 19th century. We were a small country, and if we just kind of, you know, scrunch down a little, we won't have any problems. We can just be neutral. And this was very appealing to many countries in Europe, including Belgium including Denmark, including Norway, including, for practical purposes, uh, Spain and Portugal in the 20th century. Right, let's not get drawn into big power politics. So if, if you can imagine a world in which the EU just falls to pieces, and so you have 28 independent states or largely independent states there, uh, would this be better for the United States? I mean, would we then have real partners that we could rely on? I, I, let me just say, I'm, I'm skeptical. I, I don't think it follows that we should be campaigning to tell the Brits that they should stay in the EU. I'm not saying that. But I think um, we should perhaps be a little bit cautious about being able to project what kind of world would serve our interest or the world's interest. Uh, there's a reason why small countries want to be in some larger entity. And um, uh, I think it's important both as a matter of intellectual clarity and as a matter of kind of national self-respect for people to have awareness of sovereignty as something that matters that you want to hold on to. But maybe we should be a little bit cautious about telling countries in Europe, uh, this is exactly what you want to do, and then you too will be a superpower, which they will not believe in the Netherlands or Belgium, and it won't be true. Um, but I do want to say that Todd's book is a very good read. I mean, it's fun. And there's a lot of interesting anecdotes. There are a lot of things in it that were new to me. And it's, I mean, we sh really do need to think about this. It is an important challenge in the world. And it's a very clear articulation of a certain perspective on this that, that makes it a valuable book. So thank you. Good. We'll have a little discussion here before we open it up to questions. Uh, I'll give Todd a chance to respond first to the various commenters. So take it away. Thank you, John. Um, 
I had a little, I had a couple of acoustical problems um, hearing back here, so I'll use that as an excuse for not answering everything. Um, maybe I'd like to start out just with, uh, with uh, Jeremy's comments about uh, Canada and Norway and so forth um, with an anecdote. I remember I was at a cocktail party. We diplomats, you know, we always go to cocktail parties and have fun. <laughs> Taxpayers pay for it. Um, uh, in Brussels, and I was talking to the head of the uh, North America office in the uh, European Commission in uh, what at the time was called the Directorate General of External Relations, so kind of the proto-foreign ministry, let's say, of the EU, head of the North America office. And um, this was during the Bush years, and he was saying to me, you know, Canada is so easy to work with. Why can't you guys be more like Canada? And I said, so, Gunter, uh, when is Canada going to join the EU anyway? That would be my answer to that. I thought it was funny. Um, yeah, I mean... You're absolutely right, uh, Jeremy. You know, the, the EU is characterized in many ways much more by its weakness than by its strength. Um, but, and there are all kinds of trends that are going on that I talk about in the book that are not necessarily connected directly to global governance. But part of the thesis of the book is that global governance is, one, uh, a, uh, a manifestation of a new kind of post-Christian, post-modern development in the formerly Christian West, and that it's important to recognize it as such if one is a thinking person is thinking about what's happening in the West as a whole, and, and, and how can we understand it, and thus how can we try to deal with it, um, one. Two, as John points out uh, in his work on global governance, global governance may seem to be weak. Uh, you know, I'm reminded a little bit of you know, Stalin saying, where, are, where were the Pope's armies? You know, where are the European Union's armies? But uh, you know, if you're concentrated on the power of worldviews, about what people believe, about what they are committed to, the EU's ideology of global governance is a very, very attractive and powerful ideology. It exerts a huge amount of power over the elites in the European Union. It exerts a huge amount of power over uh, those who are involved with other international organizations like the United Nations. And it exerts a huge amount of power over the left in the United States because it's all part of this kind of post-Christian, postmodern uh, attempt to remake the world in its own image. And therefore, um, the EU is not significant for everything. Um, but it's very significant as a very important and attractive manifestation um, that is dangerous to democratic accountability, that is dangerous to self-government of the postmodern, post-Christian worldview. And of course, another thing about the book is um, you know, it says, I noticed uh, in the, the program, it said it was 280 pages. Um, I want to assure you that actually 50 pages of that are notes and so, so forth. So, you know, in, in, in a little bit more than 200 pages, um, you have to generalize. And I think one of the problems very often with, with dealing with political issues that are bigger than just single political issues is the... The, the, the fear of generalization. You have to have a general understanding of what's generally going on in order to understand the thing and its larger significance. Um, my comment on Dalibor's uh, remarks, I, I could hear you less, unfortunately, than I could hear others. Um, but I just want to say that it, it, it's... From, from what I did understand of it, it was, it was quite typical of many of the pro-EU people that I've met in Brussels and elsewhere in Europe. Um, you know, kind of this pragmatic view. Well, you know, we're, part of which is 
well, it's not really working, so what you're saying is not is not valid. For example, you said something about how the Eurozone crisis is not going to lead to a fiscal union. Well, um, the fiscal, fiscal compact, for one, uh, made between all of the member states, except at the time the Czech Republic um, and, and the UK, was a big, huge step in, in the direction of fis- fiscal union. But even so, um, it seems to me strange to defend the EU this happens so often. Part of what you were saying too, Jeremy, def- defend the EU in a certain sense from criticism by saying, well, it's really not working, so what are you talking about? Um, let's see. And I want, to, I want to say something too about the whole uh, section on the Eurozone and then the, the section on human rights and so forth um, that was larger than the section on the Eurozone. First of all, there's someone in the audience who really, really helped me with the Eurozone chapters. I want to thank that person. You know who you are. I um, appreciate that very much. But uh, second, part of what I'm trying to say in the book is the EU is not about economics. It is not about economics. It's not about the Eurozone. The Eurozone is a symptom of a far larger thing. And for me, um, with my way of looking at the world, what's happening to the idea of human rights What's happening to the idea of self-government? What's happening to the, for the, to the idea of democratic accountability? Um, and the developments against all of those things that are, going, that are approaching with little cat feet in the EU is much more important than uh, whether the EU is economically a good thing or a bad thing. I think it's basically a bad thing. Um, but you know, the economic part is part. But if you want to understand the EU, you need to understand that it is not about economics. Uh, Niall, why don't you pick up, uh, Jeremy was saying, well, these 28 countries won't make, it's better to have the EU around as a partner uh, for the United States uh, than have 20 separate countries. They didn't mention NATO, of course. Um, But you may want to pick up at that point. Uh, Yes, and uh, just firstly, um, as, as Todd was saying, um, the European Union, the idea of uh, you know, the Eurozone, the single currency, um, as you say, it's not really about economics, it's about politics. The European project is a political project, it's about the centralization of political power. Uh, and uh, as, uh, as Margaret Thatcher uh, said, you know, the, the idea of creating a European super state is perhaps the greatest folly of the modern era. Uh, and uh, and I think that um, uh, you know a central part of Margaret Thatcher's arguments uh, against the European Union uh, in more recent uh, recent times, you know, were based on, on the the idea that um, uh, the the Eurozone the single currency is really a, a political project more than anything else. Um, and um, but with regard to uh, to Jeremy's uh, remarks. Does, does it make a big difference between whether the United States is dealing with a collection of nation states or a political entity formed by the European Union? I would argue that America is far better off actually dealing with a collection of nation states than it is dealing with an entity such as the, the European Union. Uh, because increasingly, I think that um, European governments are farming out their foreign policy to Brussels. And that's a very, very dangerous thing. I mean, the last thing you want on earth, I think, is to have bureaucrats in Brussels shaping your foreign policy and your national security uh, strategy. Uh, and, uh, you know, these bureaucrats in, in Brussels, they can't even defend Brussels, let alone, you know, the rest of, uh, the rest of Europe. And I, I think that Europe would be far better off, actually, if national governments had complete full control over their own national security, foreign policy, uh, and all aspects of, of government. And I think that the European Union is really, it's, it's a collection of, um, well, it's really all about the lowest common denominator uh, and doing the least amount possible, actually, to deal with a particular uh, uh, crisis. Uh, and, and I think that um, America would be in a far better position, for example, if it could deal directly with, um, say, Germany on the refugee issue or Poland with regard to uh, the rising menace opposed by uh, by 
by Russia. And what, what unites, of course, both sides of the Atlantic is really the NATO alliance. Uh, and, and I think that um, we'd be far better off, actually, without a, a supranational entity in, in Europe today and instead dealing with individual European capitals and working collectively together through, uh, through the NATO partnership. Uh, Delaware, why don't you have some comments to add? And then we'll go to yeah, questions I, 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 right after probably, your talk. I should probably clarify uh, what I said in, in my opening uh, remarks about, um, about um, the lack of evidence for the EU evolving towards some kind of actual superstate. I, I think I stand by that idea to the extent to which, I mean, first of all, there is uh, no credible intellectual case being made for a European superstate by anybody, not even by the sort of most ardent promoters of European integration, not even Mr. Barroso, not even uh, Mr. Verheugen or, or any of the, of, 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 of the Eurocrats or, I mean, their intellectual allies are making that case. Um, the problem with the EU is, in my opinion, that it's both overreaching, overextending itself, uh, trying to do too much, and it's also fairly weak. I mean, that's, that's, that's the fundamental sort of mismatch between its ambitions and between what it can actually do. And, and to solve that, I don't think we can you know, easily go back to a Europe of nation states. Uh, what we can do reasonably is to try to apply some way of thinking that was used by actually many people in the free market, limited government, conservative intellectual tradition, which is to go back to the idea of federalism. I'm not talking about federalism in the conventional uh, European sense, where it's a sort of catch-all phrase for, for more integration. I'm talking about federalism in the sense of de Tocqueville and Vincent Ostrom and, and of many economists who argue that uh, there are public goods that should be provided at different levels of government. There are Europe-wide public goods, there are national public goods, there are local public goods, and we need to have a system of government where uh, no, none of these layers uh, has some sort of absolute uh, overarching sovereignty, and we need to match these levels of, of, of governance to the sort of public goods we, we need. That I think that applies nicely to, 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 to many of the European problems, except uh, there are very few people who are, who are making that, that case today. Um, with, with regard to the fiscal pact, I mean, I wasn't making a defense of the EU in my opening statement. I was making just a sort of descriptive observation that if you see the EU on a slippery slope towards a superstate, last developments don't really lend much credence to that, to that belief. Uh, the fiscal pact is, in fact, nothing but an extension of, uh, of the previously agreed on stability and growth pact, which was the part of the Maastricht Treaty, but it lacked, absolutely lacked teeth, was not respected by, 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 by some of the leading member states, and, and it's partly why, why the Eurozone got into, 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 into its present, present, present mess. So I'll, I'll stop here. I have more to say, but, but I don't want to, to hijack the discussion. You have a book. And I have a book. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll take uh, questions. Uh, Benjamin. Thank you. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm uh, Benjamin Haddad, a fellow here at the Hudson Institute. Um, I, have, uh, I have a couple remarks and questions, actually, three, uh, three uh, areas. Uh, the first one is on foreign policy. So you said the EU and the United States are on a collision course, um, and that basically the EU was at heart a sort of anti-American uh, project. I have, a, I have a few points on this. Well, first, you said also that the EU had a huge power in foreign policy, that Mogherini had a huge power. I don't think you'll find a single person in Europe that believes that, including Madame Mogherini herself. But uh, anyway, uh, on the translating relation, at the same time, the United States has supported European construction uh, for the last 60 years. It's been a bipartisan project, actually, in the, European, in the United States to support European construction. European construction enlargement has usually gone hand-in-hand uh, -hand with NATO enlargement, if you look at uh, Central and Eastern European countries after the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, you took the example of the Iraq war. I think it, you made a very disingenuous case uh, when it comes to the Iraq war. It had nothing to do with the European Union. Some European countries supported uh, the United States and sent troops to Iraq, the UK, Poland, Spain, Italy, Portugal. Other countries such as France and Germany uh, opposed the war uh, and opposed the, the, um, the arguments in favor of the war. I don't think it had much to do with 
going to the Security Council. Going to the Security Council was a decision of U.S. diplomacy who decided to present a resolution, and then the second resolution was not supported by some members of the Security Council on the basis of the justification for the war. I don't think you'll find a lot of French and Germans who regret not going to Iraq uh, today. Uh, but at the same time, four years before, uh, there was an intervention in Kosovo led by NATO outside of the Security Council, was supported by European countries with the United States, just a couple of years ago, uh, François Hollande and David Cameron wanted to intervene in Syria outside of the Security Council, and it was the U.S. Uh, that uh, backed down on the intervention after the use of chemical weapons. So I, I think this example of the Iraq war, I don't really understand where it, it fits in this. But So my first question, I guess, is have every American president from John Kennedy to Ronald Reagan to Bill Clinton to George W. Bush been delusional in promoting European integration and European enlargement. Um, my second question uh, relates to when you talk about the lack of democracy and you often refer to voters, a majority of voters. Voters are against the project. But I don't understand where you find this majority of voters. I'm a French citizen, for example. If I want my country to get out of the European Union, I can vote for Marine Le Pen. She's running on this. Uh, she's constantly in the media. Uh, she has never gathered more than 18% in a presidential election, uh, like her father. She will probably get, get more, and I do agree there's a political momentum in the European Union among uh, uh, public discourse and, the, and the, the electorate. The Brits have the opportunity to say whether they want to stay in the European Union or not in a couple months, but I don't see any majority in any country of the European Union so far in favor of... Uh, dismantling the European Union, getting out of the European Union. So that it is your perspective on this, I understand, but I don't, I don't see where you find constantly this majority of voters that you're uh, referring to. I think it's, um, I, 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 I don't think that's, uh, that's real. And my third point, because you haven't addressed this, uh, I think both Dalibor and Jeremy Rabkin uh, uh, addressed it brilliantly, but it's the question of uh, totalitarianism. And I think it's very important. I think words matter. Um, I don't think it's a detail because it's the title of your book the new totalitarian temptation. Um, and I'll probably be more blunt than our two speakers on this. Um, usually, totalitarianism is a word that is used to define two political projects of the, 21st, the 20th century, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union. So very straightforward, do you believe that the European Union is the heir to Hitler and Joseph Stalin? OK, you have quite a bit to chew on. <laughs> yeah, man. Okay. Um, problems with my jaw. Uh, <laughs> Well, first of all, uh, the Iraq War. Uh, well, first of all, actually, Federica Mogherini. Um, you know, I mean, we could just we could make assertions against each other. You know, keep doing assertions all day. But I'm, I just want to tell you that um, no one who understands uh, how the EU actually works foreign policy-wise can possibly say that the EU High Representative even before there was officially a high representative under the Lisbon Treaty, does not have power. Um, Javier Solana, before the Lisbon Treaty, had a tremendous amount of power and influence. Um, Catherine Ashton and Federico Mogherini, it's just simply a fact. Um, the Iraq War, I wasn't saying that the EU, I wasn't focusing on the EU there, I was focusing on the ideology of global governance and how the ideology of global governance has hindered, uh, has hindered the uh, the war on terrorism, and use and 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 referring there, arguing by saying that, you know, the big conflict was about the idea of whether preventive war is legal under international law, and whether UN Security Council approval is required for the United States to invade Iraq legitimately, um, and the global governors many of them in the EU, many of them Europeans who believe in this project for global governance were the ones who were arguing that we needed Security Council uh, approval, otherwise it was not legitimate. So, you know, as I say in the book, uh, and as I said here, the EU is filled with all kinds of different currents, interests, beliefs, ideas, peoples, etc. So it's very, very hard to pin down the EU and you can always find a counterexample. My, my argument is that the heart and soul of the EU project is the belief in, the, in developing supranational governance. And that has become, post-Cold War especially, 
the belief in developing a system of global governance. So that's what I was talking about with Iraq. Um, what was the second? Uh, well, Hitler and Stalin. No, that was the but third. That was the third. What was your second? A majority of oh, voters. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't... Yes, yeah, I want majority of voters, uh, yeah. Le Pen, and so on. I, I want to. I want to uh, apologize if I ever use the phrase "majority of voters." I don't think I did, um, and if I did, please excuse me. Um, what I'm saying is not that the majority of voters in the European Union have spoken against the EU or spoken against supranational governments. What I'm saying is that voters have had very little say and very little understanding of what's going on at the EU level and how it is undermining their national sovereignty and the sovereignty of the governments that they actually do elect. The fact that someone like Le Pen has gotten up to 18% is a true testament to, the, to, 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 to what's happening, that people in the EU are realizing what's happening, and they're even voting for people like Le Pen um, and others like her because they're sick and tired of it. You know, whether that's the majority is a completely different question. And then. Um, I note to amend the U.S. Constitution, you need several types of supermajorities, and that's the way it should be, in my view. Um, in a democratic system, national governments in the EU should have absolutely no right to completely change the system of governance um, without consulting the voters. In the U.S., you need double supermajorities to, to amend the Constitution. That's not the way it is in the EU, and that's the way it should be. And what I'm talking about is transferring national sovereignty. I, I don't know what you're referring to precisely, but for example, the Maastricht Treaty, which led to the euro, was ratified by referendum in many European countries, including France. Uh, the EU constitution was rejected by referendum, and so we don't have a EU constitution. Um, so it, it is not as, as formal as a change of constitution in the United States, that's true, but I don't think it's, it was done without uh, validation of uh, voters. Yes, but my argument would be it should be, it shouldn't be 50.1 percent. It should be super majorities for such fundamental changes as is occurring steadily and surely in the EU. The other two um, questions they had, well, okay. one was um, the American the American position of all the American presidents since Kennedy. Yeah. Oh, on yes. So on. Yes. Um, you know, that, that's, a, that's an incredibly good point. Um, I would, and you use the word delusional. Absolutely not. I would not say that, you know, Ronald Reagan and George H.W. Bush and Bill Clinton and George W. Bush, et cetera, were delusional. Um, I would just say that in foreign policy very often, what happens is you, you kind of get into a habit um, that made a lot of sense at the beginning, let's say right after World War II, the United States was very was central to the launching the project of European integration because we too were tired of young men dying um, in European battlefields. Um, but unfortunately, when you've got a very busy foreign policy establishment and you've got a very busy president, um, you know, you, certain things become basic myths that everybody, that everybody takes as takes for granted basic foundations. And unfortunately, that's kind of what happened with the whole Europe whole and free idea, um, supported by the fact that the European nations that are members of the EU are still our best allies. And we want, you know, the, the instinctive thing that a president wants to do is support our allies and what he thinks they want to do. So Europe whole and free is mistaken, but it's not delusional by any, by any means. Um, new totalitarian temptation? Well, you know, um, in the book I make the case that communism and fascism were, of course, much, much, much worse than the ideology of global governance in the European Union. I refer to them as hard utopias a couple of times in the book. The EU is a soft utopia. It's a do-gooder's utopia. It's kind of a mushy, you know, feel-good utopia. But in essence, it is similar in the, in the sense that it seeks to improve the world and change human beings in a way that really can't be done via a political project. And so I say new totalitarian temptation. I don't say new totalitarianism. Lady over here had a question. 
need a microphone. There's a mic. Can we have a okay. Uh, my name is Eva Salkiewicz Munerlin. I am a Polish diplomat married with an American. We live actually in Poland. Uh, I just came here because tomorrow I'll be lecturing about the Vatican diplomacy at the Institute of World Politics because I was before charge d'affaires at the Holy See and after a consul here in Washington. I have, uh, it's very difficult to discuss about the book I did not read. I hope I will buy, of course, and later maybe if I'm here we can discuss. But what uh, results from the question, uh, from the discussion. I would like to have uh, two questions, one for Mr. Uh, Nair Gardiner and another for Professor Rapkin. Uh, I, uh, although I could be considered as a rightist, not a leftist, I say from the beginning, but it's very difficult for me to agree with uh, Mr. Gardiner about uh, <coughs> saying that uh, Great Britain without the EU would be a stronger ally, and that's why I would like to ask you a question if you think so, so what about, for example, the UN? UN is weak too, and nobody says about the dissolving UN. Of course, we could do it, but what about the reform which is about to be made from 60 years ago? We know for which reason it is not done. So in my opinion, it's better to have something which is maybe weak, but uh, trying to do something that not to have it is, otherwise what would be next? In Poland, actually, is a very big discussion about uh, being in EU, not being in EU, about the problem of illegal immigrants. As you know, we are one of the countries which we did not want to accept the immigrants because after our elections in Poland, the, the rightist party peace, which, by the way, has not a very good opinion in the U.S., as I've been told, because I just came a few days ago, and I think on the wrong reason, because as far as I'm concerned, the people vote for it, and they are right, and they can do what they are now doing, because they were entitled to do, and the whole conflict with the Constitutional Court, of course, imaginable. But anyhow, so this is one question about the EU and UN. And I think that, for example, Poland, which is a big ally of the US and a faithful ally forever, we, we have problems with EU. But whether with EU or without EU, I think that we would be a very good ally for the United States. About uh, um, to Professor Jeremy Rapkin, I would like to, um, uh, to tell you that uh, maybe I agree with you that this idea is a little bit utopian, but because you are also the director of the Institute um, for the Study of Religion, so uh, don't you think so that if the EU would be based on the common Christian values as our John Pope, John Paul II, wanted, and as Poland supported that first draft of the Constitution, which of course was rejected by French under the <laughs> direction of uh, Monsieur Giscard d'Estaing. So do you think that maybe this would be the idea that uh, this institution would be stronger, but not economically, but about the spiritual Okay, values? I think, thank you. Thank I you. Think we got the basis. So actually, it's a question for you, and for Niall first, and then Todd. Uh, yeah, thank you for your question. Um, interesting point about the United Nations. Um, and, um, and clearly the UN needs a great deal of reform, and some would argue the UN is a, is a basket case. Um, and, um, and I think that um, you, know, you raise important uh, you know, questions about the future of the United Nations. There's no discussion in Britain at the moment about leaving the UN. I don't think that that's on the, on the cards. Um, the UN also has less day-to-day -day control over what happens in in the United Kingdom. Uh, and so you don't have two thirds of British laws being um, you know, crafted uh, in the halls of, of the United Nations. Uh, and so it's a different kind of, uh, different kind of uh, debate. Uh, and, uh, and I think that, I mean, to go back to your, to your question, I, I do think that Britain can thrive uh, very well outside of, the, uh, outside of the European Union. Britain has always been a, a truly global power with global trading ties and aspirations. Uh, and I think the outlook of the British people is, is uh, quite different to that of many uh, other European uh, countries. And I can see why some, you know, uh, some nations within the EU, you have a higher percentage of those who, who strongly support the European project. In the case of Britain, if you look at those who strongly support the European project itself, it's about a quarter of the British public, according to opinion polls. There's a very low level of, of confidence 
Um, and um, I, I, I'm in no doubt, I think, that the Britain will thrive outside of the European Union. And also, Brexit um, could well open the floodgates uh, across the EU. Uh, and if, if the EU elites are so confident about um, you know, the future of the European project, they're so confident that the European project is backed by uh, the populations of European countries, well, then they should support referenda in every single European Union member state. I would suspect that in some countries that vote would be extremely close. Uh, even in a country like you know, France, for example, even in Germany now, there is a, a deep-seated debate over, uh, over the European single currency. The AFD party won uh, nearly a quarter of the vote in recent regional elections on, on an anti-euro platform. And so um, I would say there's a great deal of overconfidence in the European project expressed by many European elites. And put to the vote and put to the test, I think you'll find very close uh, uh, contests, actually, in many, uh, in many European uh, countries. But, but you raise an, an interesting and important issue about the United Nations. That's an ongoing uh, debate, and, and clearly the need for fundamental reform within the UN, I think, is an important issue. Okay, I think we're going to wrap up, probably. I think you're going to answer the question. I think the lady, that was actually a question to the Polish Diplomat had a question for you, and then De Dolabar had something to say. Right? I just a very short interjection. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, Would you on, do it, and then we'll wrap up with time. Okay. Um, on, on, on Brexit, I am not in a position to lecture the British people how they should vote on, on, on in, in, in June, uh, and I am certainly not disputing the idea that the UK can prosper outside of the of the EU. Um, in many ways, the EU has been was designed to solve problems that are not plaguing the UK. In that sense. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm very confident that British democracy will prosper and, 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 and I'm not part of the project fear. However, I think that there is a great deal of value in having the UK as a part of the European project. The British have been a benign influence on, on, on the EU starting with 1980s. I mean, it was under Margaret Thatcher's leadership that the Single European Act was passed, that the Director General for Competition was empowered to actually police the single market. Uh, that they've been a force for the good economically, and I think they are a force for the good geopolitically as well. Uh, it's maybe Mr. Putin isn't losing any sleep over what the EU does or doesn't, but he is certainly doing a very fine job trying to fund Eurosceptic parties across Europe, uh, uh, spread misinformation and propaganda, undermine our European unity, uh, erode, uh, erode um, the commitment of, of European leaders, not just to the EU, but more importantly to liberal democracy. And I think that's, that's the big threat Europe is, 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 is faced with today. And I don't see how Brexit would would, would make that threat go away. Uh, instead, I see it as, as, as potentially magnifying, opening the floodgates, as you said, towards something much, much worse. You have a quick comment? Uh, yeah, just, just a very quick response. Two, two points. Uh, firstly, on the Margaret Thatcher uh, point, and uh, as, as you say, I mean, originally, uh, many, many decades ago, I Margaret Thatcher had supported British membership of the, what was then the European Economic Community. Her views on Europe uh, were fundamentally transformed in the 1980s, uh, beginning, of course, with the, the Bruges speech in the late 80s. Um, and, uh, you know, fr from my own conversations with Margaret Thatcher uh, in her final years, I mean, she was very clear on, the, on the, her position on Britain leaving the European Union. Which didn't make it she, public, though. Well, she 100% uh, wanted Britain to leave the EU. She felt the European project was a complete uh, disaster. That's also been uh, borne out if you look at... Uh, Charles Moore's official biography of, of Margaret Thatcher as well. He makes this point. Uh, Robin Harris, a chief political advisor in the last two decades, also uh, makes this, this point. So just, just to, to set the record straight on where Margaret Thatcher stood. Um, but, but secondly, with regard to, to Putin's um, you know, backing for various parties in Europe, including, for example, the Front National in, in France, um, well, the Front National is, is a pro-Russian uh, party, and, uh, and there, there are a lot of you know, complex issues going on with regard to the Front National's, uh, you know, relationship with, uh, with, with Putin. But if you look at the, those who are supporting Brexit in, in Britain, uh, you look at the figures like Michael Gove, for example, Ian Duncan Smith, Liam Fox, these are the strongest critics of the Russian regime. And the Brexit side is largely being led by those who want far tougher action against Putin. And so this is very important to bear in mind that in, in the UK debate, those who are supporting a Brexit are intensely anti anti-Putin. 
Uh, and and I think that uh, you know you, have, you do have to make that that fundamental uh, distinction. And with regard to the Front National in in France, I mean that's not a conservative party. That's a that's a party that believes in big government and state intervention. Um, and uh, I, I don't see that as a conservative party in any in any uh, in any way. Actually, so fundamentally different organisation to to those who are campaigning for for Brexit in the United Kingdom. Okay. Uh I think, um, Todd, if you, you remember sort of the gist of oh, yeah. question about oh, yeah. the role of Christianity in Europe and, and so on. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, let me answer it this way. And, I, and, and I then hope, that'll be the end. Yeah, and I hope I'm answering, answering your question because there were many elements and it was a while ago. But, uh, you know, Poland being a friend of the United States, being a, a special partner of the United States, whether it's in the EU or not, I agree with completely. Um, and, and I, at the same time, agree with what Niall was saying, that it would be wiser and better for the United States to support a Europe of sovereign, democratically accountable nations. Whether the EU can be rolled back to be an organization that still does the good things that it does, namely foster cooperation and amity between European nations, but fully respect the sovereignty of the European nations, that's an open question. I would hope that it can. I don't know that it can, because the substance of the EU is so dedicated to supranationality. But certainly the Poles would be good friends, are good friends of us, whether they're EU members or not. Um, the fact that there's a very strong debate in Poland about EU membership and what it means is a reflection of one of the big reasons Poland is a friend of the United States, namely there is a vibrant democratic culture in Poland. Um, and there's a vibrant debate between people who disagree with each other. And that's the, those are the types of countries that are going to be, have much more of an affinity for the United States and be better partners for us in the world because that's what we believe is the best system of government. Democrat, democracy with a vibrant debate and accountability of the government to the voters. Um, I would hope that that would not be watered down in Poland through its EU membership with time. Thank you. Thank the panel, and thank, thank you for coming.